Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started with this session. Um, this is session 1B, Utility and Asset Management. Um, a couple of housekeeping things just before we get started. Um, if you have a CEU form that you would like stamped, if you could take it over to the back right um, of the room and drop it off there, we'll get that stamped for you and you can pick it up at the end of the session. Um, and we're going to go ahead and I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, so our first speaker is Guy Carpenter. Um, Guy is a chemist and registered professional civil engineer with 10 years of utility operations experience and 22 years of consulting engineer experience. He's been instrumental in normalizing water recycling and ushering in the era of potable reuse and implemented a strategy to adopt smart water solutions as a service offering for a national engineering consulting firm. Guy is currently the water technical services leader for Murray Smith Concert Engineers. Um, so everyone, please join me in welcoming Guy. I, uh, thank you. I was supposed to have a co-presenter. Uh, some of you might know Pablo Calabuj from Goagua. Unfortunately, his flight from New York got canceled. Uh, he is the North American CEO of Goagua, which is a smart water platform a service provider. I want to try to inspire all of us, regardless of what kind of role we have, to embrace what's coming at us um, with regard to the digital water kind of tsunami and uh, to just think about what's possible and think about how we need to sort of upskill to be relevant in the future. So one of the things that we're gonna start seeing here is the Ubering of the water industry. It's already happening. Uh, there are design generators out there that now can deliver a 30% set of plans and specs and PNIDs for wastewater treatment plants within about a week. And it's using empirical data to pull that together. Uh, Transcend H2O is one of them. Most of us are familiar with BioWin and Hydromantis has GPSX. The advancements that are there are pretty incredible with all of these technologies, and we're going to see more of that. Um, everybody knows about the fact that about a third of our operators, qualified operators, are going to be retiring within the last in, in the next 10 years. And so that institutional knowledge is capturable through virtual reality training uh, that we're probably not using to the fullest extent, and we and we need to. Another thing I want to think uh, want you to think about is <laughs> with the internet of things. You know, refrigerators, if you buy, go buy a new refrigerator, they're all Wi-Fi enabled, so you can turn on the ice maker before you get home from vacation and things like that. They also have kind of rudimentary water quality monitoring on them to let you know if the water filter needs to be replaced. But we're not that far away from genetic sequencing being able to be done within 15 minutes uh, at laboratories. And so imagine when a refrigerator has the ability to determine what kind of microbes are showing up at the point of use or a full suite of metals analysis for lead and copper. And then those refrigerators can talk to each other and then they can put all of that information on the internet. And the water utility is not doing any of that. It's all privately held and it's information that can be shared by the public to each other. And um, you know, when we lose the public's trust because of water quality issues, it becomes very hard to ask them to raise rates. So we need to be thinking about how all of these technologies are pushing us in a new direction and what we need to be able to do to respond in each of our roles. Some of you may know Will Sarney. He's an international thought leader on water strategy and innovation. He recommends reading the technology fallacy, how people are the real key to digital transformation. And this is not just about water, but it's in any industry. The book lays out why an organization's response to digital disruption should focus on people and processes and not necessarily on the technology that you use. He says the most important conclusions from the research are digital disruption is primarily about people and that effective digital transformation involves changes in organizational dynamics and how work gets done. And secondly, every organization needs to understand its digital DNA in order to stop doing digital, but instead being digital. The key strategies in overcoming these challenges include creating a digital roadmap and a clear business strategy, 
building an innovation culture and cultivating a digital ecosystem with stakeholders. Um, as we look at what's going on in the industry, consumer activism, or I should say the ratepayers themselves, are driving a lot of change. Uh, customers are actively asserting their influence on a broad range of production, performance, and discharge issues, fundamentally changing uh, the way, fundamentally changing the, the way that in which utilities think and act. They are now more cost conscious, environmentally sensitive, and informed and active. And activism continues to be facilitated by, and accelerated by technology, the Internet of Things, and social media use. So responding to these concerns from the ratepayers continues to keep agency managers up at night. In addition to that, we have these megatrends that are bearing down on us, aging infrastructure, uh, maturing workforce, as we talked about with the operators in particular, but it's happening in engineering firms too. None of us can find enough engineers to do what we need to do. Water scarcity, whether it's from water quality or water quantity standpoint, depending on where you live in the US, climate change, of course, the funding gap and fragmented data. And what I mean by fragmented data is we have our CMMS, we have our hydraulic model, we have GIS, we have water quality limbs data, we have all of these sources of information and they're not connected in a meaningful way in most cases. And so we're not leveraging the full power of that data. So to address consumer activism and megatrends, you know, our responses need to rely on digital water. We're talking about you know, asset management systems and leak detection and non-revenue water, um, ways to address all of those things, smart metering. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can be doing to address these pinch points that we've got, but we've just got to embrace it. So I just want us to imagine the possibilities of integrating disparate sources of data to help us make better decisions, save money, and maximize on the value of available human resources that we do have. I'm gonna walk us through a series of scenarios that we can imagine a new world of possibilities because of the availability and integration of this data. We think about forest fires in the watershed producing organic carbon loads that will increase DBP production at surface water treatment plants. We can model, simulate, track, and prepare and train for such events using weather, water quality, hydraulic modeling, and other sources of data. But we don't typically do that right now, but we could from the watershed all the way to the point of use. Another example is using a watershed or a sewer shed modeling approach to maximize available tunnels, reservoirs, bioswales, other green infrastructure, uh, and pumping systems to mitigate sanitary sewer overflows or CSO impacts over a wide range of storm configurations in terms of intensity, duration, and location. Or coupling hydraulic models with GIS, pressure flow, power usage, and water quality data, we can understand the variables uh, that would otherwise cause us to over-engineer solutions. Uh, for those of you who are over-engineers, we use all kinds of rules of thumb and codes and standards that are pretty old. But we have a lot more data now available to us. So with that additional data, we can right size and right locate facilities, use less carbon and steel and concrete to do it. But if we just use the data. So how can uh, digital help us, all of us? And I'm hoping that you'll have a few aha moments in the role that you've got uh, today so that you can kind of think about what's possible and what you want to do differently as you plan your next steps in your career. Again, just some key facts about the water industry to solidify the mega trends that I talked about. When we compare the water sector with other industries, we see that the adoption of new technologies and innovation is between five and 15 years behind other industries. There are, are three or four uh, structural factors that have been key to this point. The first is that we are highly fragmented, not just our data is fragmented, but as an industry, we're fragmented. Uh, on average, US water systems serve about 7,000 people. Uh, this makes it very hard for water system to invest in new innovation because they're just not big enough and they're not as sophisticated. Uh, and, and invest in new innovations and technologies like multinational sectors are. They, 
They need financing and access to talent, and they need a way to spread risk and cost when they're adopting new technology. Our infrastructure goes underground, so it's sight unseen. This makes water and wastewater departments the last priority uh, when looking at municipal funding. And there's a lot of deferred maintenance. Any of you who are operators, you know that, and you, you're constantly struggling against that. Due to, the size and, due to size and funding, most utilities have not been able to build the necessary IT or OT resources that critical infrastructure actually requires. And all of these elements of, that I just talked about make it harder to attract and retain key ta talent as well as train them. When we're in the news, it's not always good news. It's not always for the best reasons. I know I'm focusing on water here, but it applies to wastewater, sewer overflows, et cetera. Like, et cetera. The water sector obviously is key to everybody's lives and their quality of lives and economic activity, but it needs to be given the right attention, even in the good times. Some other uh, headlines of late. And of course, the operator is at the center of a changing sector. Uh, at the end of the day, in most cases, water operators are the ones that on top of being in the front line dealing with day-to-day -day issues, they need to decide uh, what IT solutions to acquire. They need to be more involved in that. New technologies uh, that need to be deployed and they need to think about the investments that are going to affect the utility for the next 10 years not just the managers of the utilities, not just the engineers pushing new things. So digital water is here to make their lives easier and not the other way around. And we can look at the things like the huge amounts of data that's generated and the little bit that we actually use out of our hydraulic model and the little bit that we use out of GIS, the, the explosion of software solutions constantly being imposed on them. You know, here's a new whiz bang thing. You should buy this because it'll solve this one discrete issue that you're dealing with. Um, you know, people know that everybody's retiring soon. Again, I feel like digital water can em embody the institutional knowledge that's there and, and be able to convey that to the next generation. So what is digital water uh, and, and why is everybody talking about it? Um, when I hear about digital water, I think about how utilities can leverage all of this data, the technologies and the resources to basically take care of all of these things that are on the slide. We can do these things better with, with the integration of data and we just need the right people and tools to do it. Uh, in the following slides, I'm gonna showcase uh, a number of utilities that are leading the digital water space for different reasons. I'll talk about the city of Valencia, Spain. I'll talk about the city of Houston. We have some information about Mexico City and Toronto. And just again, my job here today is to kind of inspire you to think about what you need to be doing to, to get ready for these types of changes. City of Valencia in Spain was one of the first uh, innovation ecosystems in water and had the first operational digital twin. Um, they are the third largest city in Spain, and their water system provides water to 1.5 million people. To give some context, Valencia was the first European city uh, to have a full AMI deployment in 2008-2010 with 700,000 smart meters and deploy the first digital twin for the water sector worldwide. But as I mentioned before, we're going to talk about how they got their teams to conceive and execute new ideas that led to all of these achievements. Back in the 2000s, Global Omnium, which is the uh, parent company of GoAgua, which is the technology provider that I'm teamed with on this presentation, they realized that many of their employees had very good ideas, uh, very disruptive ideas, but because of how they were organized and their culture, they were not being listened to and the ideas were dying on the floor. Uh, and they weren't adopted. So they decided to create an open innovation center in a garage and where the top ideas could be selected for execution. The teams that proposed these ideas had the option to leave their current roles for one to two years and team up with entrepreneurs to basically create new startups to make their ideas reality. This led to over 20 ideas being selected and five startups launched from this initiative. So 
Obviously, Global Omnium is a privately held investor owned utility, kind of like Thames Water or American Water. But there are ways within public agencies that we can incentivize innovation in different ways as well, and we should look at doing that. Ten years later, what's, what, what started in a garage is a venture capital fund with over 20 million, dollar, 20 million euros of investment funds and over 20 startups working together. As a public utility, I would ask how, what incentives can you put in place to stimulate, adopt, and celebrate innovation? Also, if you're not aware, there are a number of innovation platforms within the US that you can join uh, to help spread risk and share costs associated with adopting innovation. Imagine H2O, the Water Tower in Georgia, Isle Utilities. These are all platforms that you can use if you've got an idea or if you want to adopt a, a technology that maybe other utilities would like to do the same thing and you can do it in a safe place with each other, uh, with engineering firms involved if you need it to make those things happen. So you don't have to do it all on your own. The city of Houston uh, has a centralized data lake, which if you, data lake was a new term for me and it basically means uh, like a central uh, point of truth. And so um, they have a data lake and an analytics platform and a predictive analytics uh, system that helps them deal with uh, the prevention of SSOs. City of Houston has always been at the forefront of the adoption of new technologies, working with small and large digital companies trying, to new, trying new solutions. However, about five years ago, they tried to embark on a journey to centralize all of their data and analytics into one single platform that would allow for the internal and external resources to use the same data. So a lot of times when you buy a software platform, it's really hard to let third party entities use that data. And not only is it hard, but it's also expensive. They wanna charge the third party for the use of that data. So what Houston did was try to eliminate all of that and make it much easier to plug into their platform for sharing data as well as bringing data in for modeling. This slide shows a very high level representation of the type of sources that they're centralizing in real time and sharing with vendors to solve issues like SSO reduction, optimization of cleaning schedules or minimization of the CIP budget. So the platform is kind of in the middle there. It's got the data analytics, the artificial intelligence, machine learning components to it. You can see data going in and out. And then uh, where the outs are, like the asset financial reporting, those are the outcomes that the utility itself needed uh, basically as, as, a, as a way from the integration of all of this data. They're trying to avoid buying more and more software solutions for each thing that needs to be dealt with. They want to use what they already have to make better decisions and work with outside technology vendors for new insights. Obviously, this type of IT and OT, operational technology infrastructure integration, requires a different type of IT department. Uh, with, a, with a focus on the desired outcomes of the water or wastewater utility. And I will say that Aurora Water in Colorado recently had a technology roadmap done. And out of that, they decided to create their own IT department within the water utility separate from the city just because of these issues. They wanted it to be serving their outcomes, not the entire, not the entire organization. So those are hard things to decide to do, obviously. But if we're going to fully embrace the benefits associated with digital water, sometimes that's what we need to do. So um, risk modeling for SSO occurrence and preventive maintenance is what their goal was. Uh, they were profiling their system to determine risk level of the system, developing preventive maintenance programs, uh, needs-based versus scheduled, and then identifying sensor locations. As an example of using the single source of truth to solve specific issues, they partnered with GoAgua to develop a real-time risk model to predict where grease blockage SSOs were the most likely to occur and how to prevent them. So this was very easily integrated module, module that they kind of attached to their platform that was not capital intensive. And GoAgua is not unique in this. Other technology providers do this as well. But the point is like, to find a way to make that data that you're collecting distributable in a cost-effective way and not have to buy more software. 
So they optimize their sensor locations. They're leveraging risk level for available budget in the city. They're trying to understand risk relative to reward associated with their spend. Uh, they had previously installed over a thousand sensors in their system, and now they're gonna install another 600, I believe. Uh, the analytics included all types of data sources from information from the health department to real-time SCADA and sensing data to GIS and hydraulic modeling. And by way of an example, uh, it helped the city comply with its consent decree to select optimal location of 3,000 manhole uh, monitors to monitor SSOs and maintenance issues. In the next stage of the program, they will be installing 600 manhole monitors that measure level and flow to help refine and calibrate the predictive capabilities of the system. So it's doing a good job of helping them understand where those are gonna happen and preventing them from happening in the first place. Predictive analytics to detect dry weather SSOs, and they're using wet level monitors and, and lift station behavior to help them do this prediction. The objective was to be able to predict the possibility of an SSO and to clear known areas of blockages and drop wet well levels in lift stations in advance of incoming flows by turning on pumps early. This system gave them 24 to 48 hours of notice for their operators to understand there was abnormal, abnormal flows in the system so that crews could be deployed in a timely manner. It also helped them track how many SSO events were avoided by early detection of the program of the problems, and that helped them with their compliance issues with the consent decree. City of Toronto, uh, they had an implementation of a digital twin for proactive measure ma management and water loss reporting. The city of Toronto is developing a real time solution that will allow them to run their hydraulic model in real time using SCADA and sensing data from the water distribution network. And this title of this slide says virtual sensors paired with the real system every 20 to 30 seconds detect highly pressurized areas, operations, disruptions, et cetera. Virtual sensors means that they've used the pressure and flow data from 200 real sensors at nodes in their system model as surrogates for the remaining thousands of nodes in their model. And they're basically leveraging that surrogate information to, to get better predictive understanding of how the system's operating. Their digital twin will help them monitor flow pressure and water quality at all nodes in the distribution network in real time, detect areas with low and high pressure and establish strategies to address either, and then allow operators to simulate different operations in real time, such as looking at water age or fire flow without the need of having hydraulic modeling knowledge. So the operators don't necessarily need to run the model, they can use this platform to get that information and then prepare for emergency scenarios. Mexico City has a centralized non-revenue water analytics platform of 600 plus district metered areas. <laughs> this is an interesting case study. Um, they, uh, Mexico City is leveraging digital technologies to solve this key issue in a water scarce area. The city has a historical high level of water losses. Over 50% of water produced is lost from the pipes back into the ground every year, which led to overexploitation of the aquifers and la land subsidence in the city's historic center. So six years ago, the city decided to invest in the construction of district metered areas and a single digital platform to monitor water in and out, as well as pressure and water quality. With the integration of real-time data from all of these different uh, loggers and SCADAs, They've been able to locate over 60 leaks and plan for the closure of nearly 100 wells that they don't need to be pumping water out of, which will eliminate the associated power and chemical costs, as well as land subsidence in the area. So final thoughts. Thank you. I have 10 minutes left. Final thoughts. Um, just a reminder of the megatrends here. If we aren't proactive, outside forces are gonna drive us to catch up. And I mentioned the smart refrigerators, but I'll also tell you right now, there's the ability to take data from NPDES permit discharges, both on the industrial side and the municipal side, bring that all together from various regulatory agencies and know exactly what you know, the total loadings of pollutants are in surface water. And, and again, that information is soon to become available to the general public. So collectively, we will be judged by what's put on the internet 
on how well we are all doing. And the same thing is happening with private water quality labs. If you want to take a water sample from your faucet and send it into one of these private labs to get an understanding of maybe lead and copper, you're sending the water sample in for lead and copper, but they're analyzing it for everything else too. And they're creating databases that can be shared so that I, as an engineer working for an engineering firm, can pay for that data at that private lab and know more about the water quality issues in a distribution system than the utility does itself. Because again, with the Safe Drinking Water Act, you're sampling at specific locations every once in a while, and you're not getting that real-time data of the entire system. So we really need to be proactive in this regard. Each of us in whatever role we have needs to upskill to, to maintain relevancy. And I don't care if that means you're a microbiologist in a lab or an operator or a mechanic or an engineer or a, or a manager, we all need to get good at this. I've been in the industry for 32 years and I'm having to learn a whole lot of new words to be able to implement this at our engineering firm. Um, we are making significant progress on addressing these megatrends. I don't know how else we're gonna do it without digital solutions, I really don't. There's not enough money. AWWA, WEF, ASCE constantly show us that we have huge funding gaps both on operations and capital. Uh, so we need to leverage these tools to make our dollars stretch more. And then maintaining, like, like I said earlier, maintaining the public's trust is imperative for all of us so that the ratepayers have the willingness to continue to invest in rate increases to provide the services and the good infrastructure that we all need. So with that, I uh, thank you for your attention after lunch. It's really hard to stay awake. I get it. Um, hopefully it's been a little bit of inspiring about what's going on and where real solutions are being implemented. And you can think about how your career might change as a result of some of this. You can all watch me try to get the microphone out. All right, I think it's gonna stay here. Um, if anyone has questions for Guy, please feel free to come up to the microphone here. I'm also gonna monitor um, the chat for questions as well. Uh, great presentation. Um, my question for you is with all this big data that's now being stored, um, has there been any look at what the impact of that is? Because you know, data doesn't just exist. It, lives in farms and um, I don't know the answer to that Pablo might know so I'll pass that on to him I mean I think just the fact that we have cloud computing has enabled all of this I mean I remember even 10 years ago we would run a hydraulic model and you'd have to set it to run overnight and come back and hopefully get the results you wanted so now 10 years later with cloud computing um, the biggest issue I don't think the issue so much is about the storage as much as it is the security associated with it and that seems to be what everybody's big question is. So maybe I'm missing your question about volume, but I think um, it seems like Amazon Web Services and Microsoft have got it under control. They're building new data centers everywhere. Was that the gist of your question? Oh, he's talking about on the other side of it, obviously drawing a lot of power and water for cooling uh, the impacts of the data associated with that. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's been studies on that, but that would be quite interesting to look at. If anybody knows, raise your hand and step up to the mic. Okay, well, thank you so much. And other, other oh, questions? One other question. I had a question about the um, Mexico City project. The what? A little too short for this. <laughs> I had a question about the Mexico City project. Uh -huh. um, can you go into a little bit more detail about what the NRW turned into after looking at all of the meters? And did you also look at real losses as well? They're still pursuing a goal. I think they're trying to get below 8%. I don't think they're there yet, but they're trying to get below 8%. I think that's pretty altruistic or aspirational. Um, but that is the goal. I don't know where they're at right now, but they have started shutting down those wells. Uh, as they've begun fixing the leaks. The problem in Mexico City is that there's so many places for breaks to happen. And with subsidence, it's just getting worse. 
because the land, you know, is offsetting the pipes. So every time they fix something, another one breaks because pressure is increased. And so it's going to, they're going to be chasing that for a long time. Guy, thanks for the presentation. I have a question. It's kind of a, when you first said at Smart Polling, hi. Hi. Hi, um, Mark. Oh, my goodness. Um, so uh, when, when you first put the Uberfication, it made me think about what kind of tools might we be putting in the hands of our customers from an individual perspective? Like, is there, you see something coming up with uh, usage and some other bills, like obviously some of the electric and gas utilities already have their apps. Are you seeing that on the water utility side as well? Uh, on the wastewater utility side? That, Either side, water uh, or wastewater. I mean, yeah, some utilities are doing some of those like rate your neighbor kind of a thing. Like how am I doing compared to my neighborhood in terms of water usage and that kind of thing. And, you know, they normalize the data so you can't figure out who's wasting the most water in your neighborhood, but <laughs> it's out there. Um, I, I personally think what we should be doing is talking to LG and other like consumer products manufacturers and the people who sell you the units underneath your sink for RO and getting with all of them and like, getting proactive about this and creating apps where you can collect that water quality data as they are gathering it rather than being surprised by it in five years when it's all over the internet. I don't know if anybody's doing that. I haven't heard anybody. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? Um, all right, I can ask a question, um, Guy. So you gave some really great examples of different utilities that are um, really leveraging data a lot. Um, I'm curious for those utilities that maybe are not currently leveraging data as much as they could be, like what's a, where do they start? Um, kind of what, what's the starting point? Yeah, and the quote that I gave about Will Sarney, I mean, one of the things that he talks about and where other utilities are doing this, like I mentioned the city of Aurora, doing a technology roadmap and getting everybody, all the stakeholders in the room to try to understand what is the first priority of things that you need to do is the first step. And most, more often than not, there's a couple of things that we find that is immediately addressable with existing data. One of them is the billing system isn't great for a lot of utilities, but the other issue is, and just, and just getting better data out of your AMI and AMR systems for billing purposes, but then also non-revenue water is usually a pretty easy one to grab onto if you have smart metering already in place. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Guy? You can bring the mic around. All right, thank you very much, Guy. Thank you.